Tonight, we are happy to welcome Dr. Thomas White. Dr. Thomas White has just released this book, um, In Defense of Dolphins, which will be available for sale here uh, after the lecture. It's also available in our gift shop. Um, Dr. White is the Hilton Professor of Business Ethics and Director of the Center for Ethics and Business at Loyola Marymount University in LA. In addition to numerous scholarly articles on a variety of philosophical topics, he is the author of Right and Wrong and Discovering Philosophy. He's also a scientific advisor to the Wild Dolphin Project, which is what he will be speaking on tonight. We welcome Dr. White. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank Vicki for the opportunity and the aquarium uh, for the opportunity to be doing this talk, uh, and also to thank them for their hospitality. Before I get into anything about the, uh, the substance of the talk, I want to point out that uh, you probably do not know that 2007 is actually the year of the dolphin. Uh, the United Nations, uh, the uh, U UN Environmental Program, and the Convention for Migratory Species, two UN offices uh, in Bonn, Germany, uh, who have charge of this kind of thing, decided 2007 should be the year of the dolphin, so serendipitously we get to observe that tonight in this way. Um, uh, one other logistical issue before, uh, you know, I did that before, and I said, <laughs> I said to Vicki that I wasn't going to do it again, but I just did, so bear with me while I press the right button, thank you, there we go, uh, that I'll talk for a little under an hour, and then, or maybe less than that, and then uh, we'll have questions and discussion. Do me a favor, if you would, hold your questions until, until I get through the first batch of, uh, of comments that I want to make. There'll be plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. Um, the uh, general theme that I'm going to be talking about is related to a book that I've just released, uh, Blackwell Publishing. Two of my, uh, my favorite people from Blackwell are here uh, that I have to thank also for this, uh, called In Defense of Dolphins, The New Moral Frontier. Now, when Vicki was introducing me, if you were listening, you would have heard her say that I have a chair in business ethics, that I've done philosophical writing, uh, and you may be thinking, well, what does a, uh, what do any of those things have to do with one another? You know, business, ethics, philosophy, and dolphins. And so it probably makes it, while it, it seems to make sense to me, uh, it probably uh, would uh, behoove me to say, a, a little bit about what it is, why it is that a philosopher uh, you know, writes a book about dolphins and what those connections are. Uh, because, uh, in fact, there are legitimate connections. The, uh, it is not the case that uh, I got into, as I think some of my colleagues believe, that I got into doing research on dolphins uh, so that I could uh, hang out on a research boat in the Bahamas and <laughs> deduct su sunscreen on my income taxes as a research expense. Uh, that, in fact, there are there are genuine connections. And so I want to take a minute to explain how I got into this, because it really is an accident that this is, this is about the last thing that, thank you, the last thing I ever thought I would have been doing. Uh, but in the, uh, the mid-80s, I had written a short ethics textbook for Prentice Hall. And on the basis of that, because I have a fairly uh, readable style, Prentice Hall asked if I'd do one of these huge introductory philosophy textbooks. The idea being that you know, it's one of these books that co you know, covers soup to nuts and, uh, you know, for introductory students. But what they wanted wasn't just an, an intro philosophy text. What they wanted was a book that talked about philosophical issues. That is, I got that is, to get to the philosophical topics by talking about things from other disciplines. Uh, well, I knew enough about psychology to be able to get to a, you know, do a chapter or two sort of through some psychological issues. And philosophy and theoretical physics are close enough that I, I knew I could sort of talk about the new physics and get to some philosophical issues. But they, I had to have something from the natural sciences. And I was not a science guy at all. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned to the, the staff, I did an informal talk earlier today with the, the staff of the aquarium, and I fessed up to the fact that um, my, my background in science was this, that when I was in college, we all had to take a one-year science requirement. And uh, the way that I dealt with it was to take the, the one-year general 
biology course because it was the only science course that did not have a lab. And I chose it for that reason. And I figured, okay, I escaped. I got through it, and that's the last thing I'm going to have to do with science. So frankly, I, when I got into this, I thought, I really do not know, you know that much about this. I'm going to have to figure out a way to, to do something, particularly with a, a topic out of biology. Well, while I live in California now, I grew up on the South Shore. I grew up in, in Weymouth, and you know, by the water. And as you know, you can't be around the ocean and not hear interesting stories about dolphins. Also, at the same time that I was trying to figure out how to, how to put this book together, uh, a friend of mine came back from Florida with some literature about dolphin swim programs. And at that point, I knew as a writer, you can have some really interesting experiences. So I thought, well, okay, I'll uh, figure out a way to talk about a philosophical issue related to the research on dolphins and uh, uh, you know, write that chapter. And it'll, it'll be a one, sort of a one-time thing. Well, that was, the summer, that was the spring of 1988 when I started this. So actually, this project started in 1988 and you know, is coming to fruition now. Uh, I thought, it, as I said, it was going to be a one-time thing. So I start working on this chapter in this philosophy book. As it happens, that summer, the summer of 1988, I had a postdoctoral seminar at Berkeley that uh, was on Socrates. Obviously, I do all these things that are really well-connected. <laughs> But I was in California, and people had given me some uh, dolphin researchers' names to contact to you know, learn more about dolphins for the chapter I was working on. But as I, when I got to California, I discovered that there were a couple of big controversies surrounding dolphins that were very well known on the West Coast that weren't known on the East Coast at all. And at that time, I was living in New Jersey. There was the dolphin tuna controversy. Now you know when you go and you look for, uh, to buy tuna, you look for the dolphin safe label. Well, in the late 80s, this was, this was not off the ground at all. And because the U.S. tuna fleet sailed out of San Diego, there was much controversy about the deaths of dolphins in the eastern tropical Pacific. And also because SeaWorld is headquartered in San Diego, there was much controversy about the captivity of dolphins in entertainment facilities. So as I was trying to do this one piece, sort of this one chapter in this book, I realized that uh, not only you know, was there kind of a basic philosophical issue about what kind of beings dolphins were, but there are the, were these bigger ethical issues. And so I started getting pulled in, and it got more complex. And I finished the one chapter and then continued to to look into the issue. Uh, in 1990, I had the good fortune of uh, being able to uh, start working with Denise Herzing, uh, who runs the Wild Dolphin Project, which is a research organization that sails out of uh, Florida. Uh, Denise has been, I think, since 1985, studying a community of wild Atlantic spotted dolphins uh, in the Bahamas. The study site is about 50, 60 miles north of Grand Bahama Island. And for all of those years, she, every summer, goes out weeks, you know, every week or two and simply studies, observes the social behavior, the family histories of this community of wild Atlantic spotted dolphins. And I had the, the, the good fortune of her letting me come along and start observing dolphin social behavior in the wild. And the more that I did that, the more that I realized just how different dolphins seem in the wild and in captivity and how much more complicated the whole question was. What kind of beings are dolphins? And then the second question, what does that say about the ethics of human-dolphin interaction? So at that point, I thought, well, I really want to do a book about this. And it just took me a long time, because of the complexities of this, to get to the point uh, of then feeling comfortable that I knew enough science that I could understand the philosophical issues, and that I could then get to the point of, of doing the book. So that's how this all, this all happens. And so as you see, there really are connections. The, what I've done is to look at, a, as a philosopher, I'm looking at the, the implications, the philosophical implications, of the scientific research, largely on the intellectual and emotional abilities of dolphins, to answer the question, what kind of beings are they, which is a kind of basic philosophical question, and then the second, the second question, well, from an ethical standpoint, what does that say about how we treat dolphins, about the ethics of human-dolphin interaction? And the two main areas where that comes up, 
fishing industry, entertainment industry, and since those are businesses, as you see, everything actually does tie together. So while it may be a terrific scam in the academic world, in fact, it's legitimate. So I want to make it plain just what it is that, uh, what the connections are, and then what the basic philosophical questions are and, and how this all works. Now, the, what I'm going to be talk, talking about uh, tonight is a quick overview of a piece of the book that looks at mainly this, this very basic question, the way we'd phrase it as philosophers is, is, is a dolphin a person? And I'll explain more about that, what that, what a, more about what that means in a minute. Um, and the talk is, is going to be a combination of science, anecdotes, some personal reflections of my own. Uh, it's not going to be terribly deep. Uh, there is science and much, much more detail on anything that I'm talking about. So if, if I say something and you're really puzzled about it, um, I mean, I hate to see as a, see, seem as though I'm shamelessly promoting the book, but it's explained more in the book, which, <laughs> which you can, I'm sure, borrow in, the, in a really good library once, once they buy it. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of hit the high points on this, talk about general themes, and then uh, head up towards what the, uh, the primary ethical uh, considerations are in all of this. Now, to ask the question or to talk about the issue of whether a dolphin is a person is really revolving around the difference between considering a being as a someone versus a something. We all clearly think of one another as someone, you know, not, not some kind of an object. And so to ask the question, is a dolphin a person, is to ask a question, you know, is there a way in which we're talking about a non-human person? That is a non-human being who's a, who's a who that has, that has many of the same traits that we are, but just isn't, isn't our species. Now, uh, if any of you ever took a philosophy course or had the, the, the bad luck of, uh, of uh, befriending, marrying, or having parents as philosophers, you know that what, what we mainly do is to draw distinctions. Uh, for example, if you say to a philosopher, you know, hi, how are you? Uh, the answer is typically, well, in what sense do you mean that? Uh, and, uh, what, you know, otherwise we, we, we'd have to get real jobs and this keeps us off the streets at night and not, you know, causing harm to ourselves or other people. But philosophers draw distinctions. And in this case, the fundamental distinction we're working with is the distinction between human and person. To be a human is to be a member of a, bi of a, of a certain species. So human is a biological label. It's a biological concept. What we try to do in philosophy, though, is work with something which is not so much, you know, rooted, that is talking about what kind of beings, in this case dolphins or other non-humans might be, not so much, you know, are you a member of a certain species, but rather, are you a being that has a certain set of characteristics? That is, are you a person? Now, among humans, uh, the reason that we make a big deal about this, that is, that we say that you know, humans are persons, is that we basically say, look, persons have rights. Persons, to be a person as opposed to be an object, is to deserve treatment of a certain sort. Uh, so that if I, if I took a baseball bat and, and hit the table, uh, you'd think, well, strange thing to do in the middle of a lecture, but I wouldn't be doing anything inappropriate or anything questionable. On the other hand, if I took the baseball bat and hit one of you, hopefully you'd think there was something wrong about that, <laughs> because we don't do that to, to one another. We were entitled to treatment of a certain sort. So the, the point of the distinction here between human and person is to say, is it possible to have members of another species who have the same characteristics that we do, aren't homo sapiens and therefore deserve to be treated in a way different from chairs and, and tables. Now the human person distinction is something that, that comes up with actual practical implications. Uh, the world of biomedical ethics is the first area where you tend to see that. For example, if someone, the whole concept of someone being brain dead and that if you disconnect life support that you are not murdering someone. If you, if you believe that's the case, that is if someone's brain dead and you, and you remove life support that you aren't murdering someone. 
If you believe that, you're already using the distinction because you'd agree that, yes, we're ending some kind of human life, but the person has already died. The individual who was unique just isn't there anymore because the brain has, has, has ceased functioning. So that's an area where biomedical ethics is an area where the concept, in fact, is used on a, on a practical basis. Sadly, one of the other uh, areas in our history as a species where it was used in the whole notion of slavery. The, to say that, well, a slave is property, not a person, which is, is part of American history, is to use the, that same notion. That was part of the defense of slavery, that, you know, that Africans brought over weren't really, they weren't people, they were property. And so part of the, the defense of slavery was also, was also there. So, the human person distinction raises two questions. First of all, are all humans persons? But the second question, which is the one that we're concerned with, is are there non-human persons? Now, the main way in which you've probably run into this question is the world of science fiction. Uh, if you're familiar, familiar with Klingons or Romulans or Vulcans or any of the a panoply of aliens in science fiction, or if you're a fan of the notion of UFOs or alien abductions, uh, those would be examples of non-human persons, beings that you could communicate with, who could think, who could do all the things that we do, but just don't look like us and are of a different biological uh, family. Um, however, more recently, uh, it's become apparent that even the notion of non-human person is not something that's just in the domain of science fiction. Uh, in the last month, there is now a case in Austria where there's a lawsuit asking a, that a chimp be declared a person. Sort of a long story about why this is, but nonetheless, there's a legitimate case that's being advanced there. In Spain, I believe there's there, uh, still some provisions in the legislature there that great apes other than humans should be regarded as persons again, that they share many of the same traits that we do. So the notion of a non-human person is no longer in the domain of, of science fiction. There seems to be a fair amount of science to suggest that humans are not alone anymore in having traits that we used to say uh, we were the only possessors of. Uh, what I want to do, uh, obviously, tonight is to ask the question, are dolphins examples of that? Are dolphins non-human persons? Well, to start, it then means that we have to get some background and, and be aware of, of some difficulties that we might encounter in even asking that question. First of all, we have to remember that dolphins are very much like us. And when you recognize that, though, there's a, there's, there's a danger. There's the danger that uh, scientists refer to and thinkers refer to as anthropomorphism. That is that when we see a behavior, something that looks like what we would do in a non-human, there's the danger that we, we interpret it as though we were doing it, that it means exactly the same thing. And there are lots of examples where we have misinterpreted what uh, non-humans have done. The, the most famous example of this was a horse called Clever Hans, who uh, it was thought had the ability to uh, do arithmetic. Um, and, in fact, there was this, I think it was in Germany, this, in, that this horse, they, you know, the trainer would stand there and they'd, people would put uh, math problems to the horse and the horse would, you know, stomp out, you know, either what, Hans, what's four plus three? You know, stomp, 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 you know, up to seven. And this, the horse, it looked like the horse could do math. Well, what they didn't realize was that unconsciously the trainer was tapping his finger and stopped at the answer wasn't doing it deliberately. The trainer didn't even know he was doing it. But initially, people said, well, gee, the horse must be able to do arithmetic. It must have this intellectual ability. That's an example of anthropomorphism, assuming that when you see it in a non-human, it means the same thing as if a human were doing it. Now, the flip side of all of this is that dolphins are very much unlike us, which is a very important thing to keep in mind. The danger there, though, is that we don't appreciate the difference enough, and in that case, we risk having, making the mistake called anthropocentrism, which is to interpret everything always through the lens of human behavior. That is saying, well, only if, 
it's just only if the, the dolphin or a chimp or an elephant does something in a way that's just like us, then it's not exactly the same. So there's a kind of bias there that we have to guard against. Sexism, racism, this would be considered a kind of speciesism, the idea that you know, sometimes your standards that, are, that you think are neutral and objective aren't. And so in this kind of an investigation, these are two of the things that we have to guard against. Overinterpreting evidence that makes it seem as though, in this case, dolphins have, have abilities like us, or not interpreting them appropriately because they come from a different evolutionary line. Okay, so let's get down to some of the basics on this. If the basic question is, is a dolphin a person, what does it mean to be a person? Now this is a general definition. What I'm going to put up is a series of traits, a general definition that you know, most philosophers would agree to as what the main traits are. For a being to have those special traits that we've historically said are true only of humans. Well, first of all, you'd want to be, you, a being would have to be alive. Secondly, it would have to be aware of it, the outside world in some way. You'd want, uh, you know, to be a person, you'd want it to be able to feel pleasure and pain. That is, to experience the sort of positive and negative sensations about the world around it. Uh, getting a little more complicated now, you'd want to see emotions in that, in that response, in that inner world. Uh, now getting much more sophisticated, you want to, you'd want to see some sense of self, personality. You'd want individuality. And historically, we have said humans are the only beings who can look inside and say, I. Not just because it's one thing to have a sense of awareness of the world, it's another to be able to reflect on that awareness, to reflect on your emotions, and now have a more complicated inner world. Because notice as we go down the list, what we're getting is a more sophisticated inner world. We're getting more sophistication in terms of intellectual and emotional capacity. And these then become the hallmarks of what it is uh, to be a person. To be a person also you'd want to have behavior that is the result of choice, self-controlled, not the result of instinct, not the result of just stimulus and response. After all, when we behave, hopefully most of the time, it's by choice. It's one of the reasons we hold one another responsible for actions, because we believe if, you know, if, if I pick up the baseball bat and hit you over the head, you, must, you believe I have a choice to do that. And so if I've done that and I've done something wrong, I should be punished because I was responsible for that behavior. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't an aberration. That action was a function of who I am and what I chose to do. We'd also want a person to recognize and to treat other persons appropriately. And a set of abilities that are really the favorites of, of humans in this, we definitely want to see a series of higher order intellectual abilities. Everything from abstract thought, the ability to learn, to solve complex problems, and to communicate in a way that suggests thought. Now you put all of those things together, and as I said, what you get is a being, and in this case it doesn't matter what species we're talking about, but a being that has an increasingly sophisticated inner world, increasingly sophisticated intellectual and emotional capacity, the ability to say I, a sense of uniqueness, personality, emotional life, inner world. And so the question now becomes, well, if that's what a person is, what does the science of the last 30 to 50 years tell us about dolphins. And so what I'm going to do now is just, you know, we're going to do some random discussion about, about what we know about dolphins, and then we're going to come back to this definition at the end and see how, how dolphins do on this score. Okay, first of all, dolphins are whales. If you didn't know it, dolphins are a small toothed whale, and uh, the family obviously, as you know, has non-toothed whales. Uh, toothed whales, dolphins are are, even though they're small, they're whales, and they're on the toothed side of the family. In fact, dolphins have these very sharp uh, cone-shaped teeth. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you a story about that, which is one of the ways I can always remember how important that is. Uh, when, I, uh, when I taught in New Jersey at, uh, at Ryder College, we had a January term, and I would take students uh, on basically a, a, a one-week 
dolphin course in which I talk about some of these issues. It'd be a, and, and the Dolphin Research Center uh, has kind of a one week, very good introduction to, to dolphins, uh, which is particularly good because it's a facility that has a community of bottlenose dolphins who live there. And it's on the Gulf side of the key, uh, so it's not that they're in concrete tanks or anything of that sort. Well, one of the highlights of the week is that the students get as much time as they want sitting on the docks where the dolphins come and go. And the staff would always point out at the beginning of the week that, you know, they, that one of the things you'd want to do is to be sensitive to the fact that if you had your hand in the water, for example, as the dolphins would come by, uh, what might be the case is that you'd have your hand in the water and a dolphin would come up and it might start mouthing your hand. Now, trust me, at that moment, you are very well aware of just how many and how sharp those teeth are. And your first inclination, of course, is to yank your hand back, but your inclination better not be that because you'll scrape your hand because these teeth are so sharp. Well, it turns out that there's a reason that the dolphins are doing this. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but if a dolphin does this, the staff call it the trust test. What the dolphin is looking to do is, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave your hand there and trust that it's not going to chomp it off? Or are you going to flinch and show that you don't trust the dolphin, in which case you failed? Now, was, interestingly, at the um, uh, talk earlier today, one of the people on the staff who had had experience with dolphins at another facility uh, pointed out that uh, at the facility that she had worked at, if you flinched, and they had, this was an issue also with trainers, if you flinched, the dolphin felt, oh, we've got your number. <laughs> You're now just a live toy. We're just going to spook you in whatever way we can because you just, you know, you, 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 aren't, you, you, you can't handle it. At this other facility that I took students to, they'd always say that if you flinched, the dolphins would think that you just weren't even worth spending any time with, and they'd basically ignore you. So, but the interesting thing about this is it's deliberate. It's a trust test. And in, in the book, I recount an episode in another part in some other research done in Australia where dolphins would do the same kind of thing. So very interesting that you have this going on uh, as a way of checking out the relationship, which, by the way, tells you something about dolphins. Turns out relationships are huge in terms of, of who they are. OK, dolphins are mammals. Uh, that uh, They are air-breathing, warm-blooded. They're born alive, uh, nurse uh, off of female mammary glands, and have hair. Well, you look at a dolphin and you don't see much hair. Uh, but if, uh, if you ever see a baby dolphin, there are a few hair follicles right around the rostrum, the, uh, the beak there, and they fall off fairly quickly. Uh, but dolphins have, uh, dolphins do have hair, they're mammals, which then, in many ways, you know, they're like us. But the body temperature, by the way, is very close to ours. Big brains, you know, so like us, they're, that's one of the ways in which they're a lot like us. Dolphins, as mammals, actually came from the land. This is the uh, ancestor of all modern whales and dolphins, something like this, a coastal mammal that eventually went back to the ocean full time. Uh, went back to the ocean full time approximately 50 to 60 million years ago. Uh, this, all cetacea, the cetacea is the biological category of whales, uh, common ancestor that we, we just had up of all whales and dolphins went back to the water about 50 or 60 million years ago. And the modern dolphin, the one that you see now in, you know, uh, out in the ocean, uh, that size, body size, shape, configuration, brain design, that's about 15 million years old. That got stabilized about 15 million years ago. Humans, by contrast, have been on the planet about 3 million years and the shape, size, brain configuration and all of Homo sapiens, I understand it, is about 100,000 years old. So when you figure 100,000 years, 15 million years, that's one of the significant differences between our species. We have a species that's, that's been adapting over a longer period of time, has been in a different environment for a longer period of time, and one of the interesting things to speculate about is what's the significance of that and how does that bear upon questions like intelligence or self or personality or things of that sort. 
But this is one of the big differences between the, the two of us. Now, the fact that dolphins went back to the water uh, meant that they had to adapt to life in the ocean, and the ocean is a dark place, and the ocean is a place where then sound is going to work better than, than light. Uh, in fact, one of the ways in which dolphins had to adapt by going back to the ocean is that uh, they became conscious breathers. You know, for us, when we go to sleep, you know, or if you be we become unconscious, we'll continue to breathe. It's an autonomic function. Uh, that's not the case with dolphins, because that would have been dangerous in the water uh, to take a breath. You know, if you doze off, you take a breath, you're going to drown. So one of the adaptations back to the ocean is that dolphins don't really sleep the way that we do, and that each breath is a, is a conscious choice. One of the most important adaptations, as I said, sound is going to be very important, is that dolphins have a, a sense, well, it's either that they have a sense that we don't have, or their sense of hearing is so much more sophisticated than ours that you may as well think of it as a different sense. It's called echolocation. First of all, let me show you what it sounds like. I'll play it again. What you want to listen for is that kind of creaking door sound, and you'll hear it at a lower frequency, and you'll hear it at a higher frequency. I'll explain what the difference is, but this is, this is how dolphins scope out the world around them. Okay, dolphin vision is actually quite good, but echolocation is the main way in which they uh, understand the world and perceive the world around them. The way it works is this. Dolphins breathe through a, it's called a blowhole, a hole on the top of their head. Uh, below that, there are some nasal sacs, and they can manipulate these sacs in order to generate these high frequent, the, these clicks the click will bounce off the skull, and if you look at a dolphin's skull, at this point, it's like satellite dishes, kind of parabolic. It'll bounce off, it'll be projected through what's called the melon. This is a bit of fatty tissue on the front part of a dolphin's head that can be manipulated like a lens. And in fact, if any of you, have, well, it's hard to see on dolphins, if any of you have ever seen beluga whales, and you see a beluga whale with its skull going like this, it's manipulating its melon. Uh, and like a lens, the sound goes out, it'll bounce off an object, it's, it's sonar that we're talking about, bounces back in, comes into the lower, lower jaw, inner ear, and gets connected to the brain. Now the, the images that dolphins get from this sound, you know, the sonar out, sonar back, is so sophisticated that it's actually three-dimensional. And the best because, after all, sound goes through tissue. Sound goes through living tissue. You know, if you, light doesn't, but sound does. And the best story I can give that shows the significance of this, at the Dolphin Research Center, this facility in Florida, um, there was a trainer who was visibly pregnant, who was working with one of the dolphins who was pregnant. And the dolphin came up and sonared this woman's abdomen and sort of flipped over, you know, showing her you know, sort of growing belly, and they, they did this, you know, I'm pregnant, you're pregnant, isn't this cool moment. Uh, well, about two weeks later, I'm told, they, there was a dolphin swim going on where there was this man and a woman in the, uh, in the swim, and this dolphin, same dolphin, came up to the woman, sonared her abdomen, flipped over and did the same thing. And the trainer handling the swim said, well, that's interesting. The only other time we've seen this is when this dolphin did this with Linda, who was pregnant. Is it possible that you're pregnant? To which the woman's husband said, I certainly hope not. <laughs> well, you can guess the story. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, they get a call, and yes, the woman is pregnant. But the significance is she was barely pregnant at that moment, and the dolphin understood human anatomy and physiology well enough 
to not only get this very precise three-dimensional image, but to understand what its significance was. So there are lots of stories about dolphin echolocation, but that tells you a little something about, about how, it, how it's used. And also, then uh, clearly, this dolphin understood human anatomy and physiology. Now, another th thing about dolphins and sound is while we know very little about how they communicate, and we really don't know much about their sounds at all, one thing that we do know about is called uh, signature whistles. And I'll play you a, an example of this. What you want to listen for is a high frequency sort of sweeping sound. So it's not the lower frequency uh, sound, it's that high frequency sort of wavy sound. Now, the reason this is significant is that scientists have discovered that each dolphin has a unique signature whistle. Each dolphin has a unique one of these things. They, in fact, can track these in some way. There are relationships among, like, the mothers and the sons relationship, uh, mothers and the sons, mothers and daughters, uh, because the, basically, a kind of way of, of preventing inbreeding. But it sounds like that, and, the, and that the way that dolphins use it, that it's the equivalent of a name. That is, that it's personally identifying information about who they are and how they use it. Now, as I said, we really know very little about uh, the signature whistles and, and dolphin whistles, because even with, with signature whistles, it's, th there are a different, couple of different theories about how, what, that, what, what information is being coded and decoded. For example, if you pay, it's one thing to, have, to s have a name. For example, I say, okay, my name is Tom. On the other hand, though, if, you, if, I, if I call a friend and say hello, and that person on the other end of the line recognizes me from the sound of my voice, not from the fact that I've said my name. That is, th th what they're doing then is getting personally identifying information about me from the tone, from the character of the sound. And so scientists don't know that th there's one, th one school of thought that says this is, what, this is the way dolphins communicate personally identifiable information, which is another way of saying that if you're talking about a being that has adapted to the ocean where sound is more important than vision, they may even use sound in a more complicated way uh, than we do. And in fact, there are human languages where tone is significant in terms of meaning. Uh, it's not that significant in English, but in other languages, uh, my understanding like Chinese, tone is very important. So it may be that dolphin sounds have that as a component of, of meaning, but for our standpoint, uh, you wouldn't have that kind of sense of identity, a name, or personally identifying information unless you had a notion of self underneath it, underlying it. Now, speaking of self, because this becomes one of the most important factors as far as what humans like to talk about when it comes to issues of um, personhood, uh, you know, is there any other evidence that would suggest that dolphins have a sense of self? Well, among humans, human develop, child developmental psychology, uh, there's an important test that's done to determine at what point a child has a sense of self. And it's about putting a child in front of a mirror and seeing what they'll do. Do they think that the image in the mirror is another baby, is another child, or do they recognize that it's themselves? There's a very, in terms of brain development, it's very significant at a certain point a child looks at the mirror, knows it's themselves, knows that it's their reflection. And so you get, a, as I said, a number of very sophisticated intellectual operations going on. So what scientists have done is to say, well, what, what would happen if we put other animals, other non-humans, in front of the, the mirror to see what would happen? Well, seems as though chimps do pretty well on the, the mirror test. Uh, I think at least one gorilla has done well. Uh, I've heard very recently there's evidence that elephants may do pretty well in this regard. So the question is, well, where do dolphins stand on this? Uh, okay, so let me show you a, oh good, this seems to be working, a bit of, whoops. Uh, 
Okay. Now this is from uh, some uh, work that was done by Diana Reese and Laurie Marino. Diana Reese from uh, Columbia University in the New York Aquarium. Uh, Laurie Marino of Emory University. Uh, some work that they've done on dolphin, mirror self-recognition among dolphins. Uh, this is a dolphin. This is its reflection. Take a look and see what you think. Now, there's certainly good reason to, uh, to think that what you have going on there is a dolphin mugging for its, you know, sort of playing with its own reflection, and that it, it is not acting as though it's another dolphin. In fact, if you have any experience with dolphins in the wild, you know that when they go head to head, it's very aggressive. Uh, no two dolphins would, do, would behave like that in the wild if it were because it would be an aggressive encounter. And so there's good reason to think that you have dolphins like chimps and gorillas and maybe elephants, that having a sense of self. Now, that's really significant. However, uh, oops, let me go back one, one bit on this. Uh, remember, I said that dolphins use sound more than they use vision. So while dolphins do really well on this, you have to figure that they're operating in what, what some scientists refer to as a foreign cognitive environment. That's not their main way that they, they operate. Vision is not the, way the main, they, main way they operate. A real test would be a sound test. But I've talked to the scientists who worked on this, and they haven't really figured out what that, what that would be. That is, how you figure out whether a being that's sonic can identify itself from something about, the e I guess, the echo of its own sound. So it's impressive. Not only is it impressive that dolphins seem to do well on this score, it's impressive because they're operating in a domain that's not really their strong suit, which is especially impressive as far as intellectual and cognitive capacity. Well, when we talk about intelligence, obviously one of the first things that comes to mind is the notion of that you've got brains. And one of the ways in which we see that uh, a claim can be made for the fact that we're probably talking about beings who are hardwired with a fair amount of intelligence is that, for example, this is a monkey brain, this is a dog brain, this is a orangutan brain, human brain, and dolphin brain. One of the differences between these brains and this, obviously, first the size, and in fact the dolphin brain, this is the brain of a bottlenose dolphin, is bigger than that of a, of a human brain. Uh, but more importantly than size, you'll see that these foldings, these gyrations, uh, much more there than in these brains. The fold possible to have more gray matter on the brain. The foldings make it possible to have a greater cerebral cortex, which is where we say that historically and traditionally our higher uh, intellectual functions reside. Now, it's, also, it's true that the uh, dolphin brain is bigger than the human brain, but it's also true that it's less dense, that neurons are more tightly packed in this brain than in this brain, this brain has a different design than this, but nonetheless, looks pretty significant that you've got, uh, you've got fairly big brains there. Uh, now, as I said, though, we also we do have ways in which the brains are, are different. Now, one of the interesting scientific challenges and philosophical challenges is when you see the differences, which one is the standard? What's the standard for then which, is, which has something and which is lacking something? For example, the coloring on this shows that we do have, this is a motor strip on the human brain. We have a motor strip on the, on the dolphin brain. This is where, where, on your brain, the capacity for engaging in certainly, certain motor activities reside. A touch strip, this is sort of a sensory strip. You have uh, hearing here. You have vision here. Now notice that you've got, on the dolphin brain, this stuff is all really close together. The human brain, you have this stuff here. You have sound here. You have vision back here. And dolphin scientists call this an example of cortical adjacency. That is, in the, in the cortex of this, the dolphin, you have more of these capacities clumped together better. And they can tell you ways in which dolphins seem to perform some tasks better than humans because their stuff is all clumped together. And on the humans, it's more spread out. So 
we, you say, okay, well, which is a better way, which is a worse way? Is this the right design or is this the right design? Hard to say. Uh, this is an example of a human brain, dolphin brain. Now, in the human brain, you have two lobes, what are called a limbic lobe and a supralimbic lobe. Well, in the dolphin brain, you have the same thing, limbic lobe, supralimbic lobe, but then you have this third lobe in here. We don't have that. Well, does that mean that the dolphins have something that's superfluous? Or does that mean that we're lacking something? Again, the point of this is to, is to suggest that when you start talking about intelligence and you start talking about brain, uh, there's some very suggestive evidence there. But part of the, what's suggestive is just how different everything is. And we have to be very careful about saying that to be intelligent, you have to do everything exactly the way that, that humans would. Now, there are some empirical measures that scientists use to suggest levels of intelligence. One is the ratio of the weight of the brain to that of the spinal cord. And with humans, we get a ratio of 50 to 1. With dolphins, 40 to 1. Apes, 8 to 1. Cats, 5 to 1. Horses, 2.5. And fish, actually less than 1. The idea here is that this measure tells you something about the kind of cognitive sophistication going on in that excuse me, in that particular being. Another favorite one that, dolphin, that scientists use is called the encephalization quotient, the ratio of the brain weight to the body weight. And here we have a ratio of 7 to 1, 4.6, 2.3, 1, and whoops. And see, we then have humans and dolphins really pretty good on the score. However, Remember before I said one of the dangers is the issue of whether in an unintentional way we're tilting things in our direction. If you go back and you look at the encephalization quotient, 7 versus 4.6, a few years ago one scientist said, you know, we haven't thought about the difference in body fat. Dolphins have more body fat than humans do. So if you do a rough calculation and take body fat out, notice that the difference is less than before. An example of how even in modern science we can make unintentionally make mistakes that instead of thinking that there's this big difference, maybe the difference is even less, which then becomes certainly less significant. Uh, now I want to go through a couple of things really quickly uh, so that I'm not running over. There's been some very interesting research on the capacity of dolphins to understand human language. Uh, research one uh, dolphin using uh, hand signals, learning ha hand signals in an artificial language, another using sound. The dolphins did extremely well. This was research done over 20 years at the University of Hawaii, understanding commands, understanding commands in a human artificial language. Uh, but there again, we have a problem of, well, you know, we don't really see that same kind of thing in dolphin life. So again, the fact that dolphins can operate in a world intellectually that doesn't seem to be theirs is another example of just how much intellectual capacity there may be there. And one other point about this, uh, which I go into at some, some considerable extent in the, in the book that I uh, can't take the time here, there's some very interesting theory and research done by a, a neurologist, John Wilson, who has claimed, argues that the reason that we humans have language the way we do is because we have hands and that the hand and the brain co-evolved. That is, and that many of the measures that we have of intelligence are driven by the fact that our brains developed in order to accommodate what we needed to do with these, with, with hands. Now that raises the question, okay, what do you have then if you have a dolphin with a big brain no hands. What's the dynamic of the development of the brain in relation to that body? At the very least, you probably are not going to look for language the way you see it in humans because you don't have these things working with the brain. Nobody knows exactly what that means, but again, it suggests that intelligence might look very different in the water. Intelligence in dolphins might be very different than intelligence in humans for as simple a reason as the fact that we've got these things and they don't. Which then means that things like intelligence, 
language might have to be defined and understood in a species-specific way. They might look different among humans, dolphins, chimps, elephants. We don't know, but again, it's this thing we have to keep an open mind about. And a final thing that uh, we, we see as a fairly common uh, marker of personhood and significant intellectual ability is the capacity to solve problems. Well, again, a story from the Dolphin Research Center. This is a facility that not only has its own dolphins living there, but it's sort of a rehabilitation, rest, and recovery place as well. And they got a call one time from a, uh, an aquarium in another part of the country that there was a dolphin who you know, was not doing well, needed, to, needed some help. Would they be willing to let it come down and recover? They said, of course. Dolphin gets shipped down. And on the way, the staff is now trying to figure out how to handle this. Because dolphins are very social. You would not want to put a dolphin into a, into a pen by itself. And so they were trying to figure out what the best pairing would be, you know, where to put, take this new ill dolphin in with others. And they finally decide on these two dolphins, these two males. But one of the males liked to come and go so much that it had made a hole in the fence. As you can see, this is, this is right by the, this is on the gulf side of the Keys. These are not concrete tanks. These are fences that are more to keep other things out than to keep the dolphins in. And one of the dolphins in the pen had made a hole through the fence so that he could just come and go rather than jump over the fence. Well, what the staff did was to patch up the hole because they were afraid that this new dolphin would be in there, get panicked, might shoot out through the hole, get lost, and could die. What they didn't know was that after, the, after they had patched the hole, the other dolphin went back and opened it up again. <laughs> So the new dolphin comes down, they put it in, and it's panicky because it's in a new environment. And what they feared happened did. It sees the hole, it shoots out through the hole, and takes out for the open ocean. As the staff is trying to figure out what to do, the two dolphins in the pen take off after the third, catch up with it, turn it around, and bring it back. Now, as though that weren't impressive enough, now that the other dolphin has calmed down, it doesn't want to come back in the pen. Because going through openings like this or this, is there seems to be an instinctive aversion among dolphins to do that. And it, to train dolphins to go through that, which is called gating, is a really tough thing to do. Well, now that this other dolphin had calmed down, it didn't want to go through that hole. So again, the staff is trying to figure out what to do. These other dolphins, one swims back and forth through the hole to show it's okay and what to do. All three of them come in, they patch the hole, and everyone lives happily ever after. Well, the fascinating thing about that, of course, is that you have a really serious problem, a complex problem, one that couldn't be anticipated, absolutely not in the normal life of a dolphin, and they solve not one, but two dimensions of it. So you get two very significant, complicated problems. The dolphin solves it. You know, and there's other research on problem solving, but that's my favorite example of, of that kind of thing. So if you go back to where we started, that is this definition of personhood, being alive, aware, the ability to feel pleasure and pain, have emotions, self-consciousness, recognizing other persons, higher order intellectual abilities. I'd contend that dolphins do really well on this. In fact, I, after all the years I've been working on this, I, I believe that dolphins are non-human persons and that that then raises important ethical questions in a couple of different ways. But, you know, it then you know, forces us to start thinking about non-humans in a different way. And the other big ethical issue, of course, is the use of dolphins in captive facilities. Is that okay? Is the captive breeding that we use okay? If you decide it's not, what do you do about the 400 or more captive dolphins that are, that are in facilities? You can't let them go into the wild, they'd all die. But again, it poses very serious problems for our species of now kind of recognizing that the traditional assumption that we all had for thousands of years, that humans were absolutely unique on the planet, unique in having a sense of self, a sense of identity, uh, the capacity to think in a complex way, uh, and that we were the only species for whom individual life counted, that that's something that it may be time for us to seriously consider, reconsider our assumptions about, 
And as I said, while I've been talking only about dolphins, there's interesting research that, that brings up very similar issues about, uh, about other uh, mammals, chimps, elephants, uh, for example. And I think that as a species, we're now at the point where we have to take very seriously the idea that uh, we are no longer as alone as we thought we were. Thank you very much. <laughs>